Imagine it's the mid 1800s. Since the end of the Napoleonic Wars, peace had been secured between Britain and France for almost half a century. And yet, the threat of an imminent invasion never seemed too far away. That's why thousands of navvies and volunteers, accompanied by artillerymen, engineers and army officers, were all summoned here in 1860 to build and occupy these gigantic fortifications should the dreaded day arise when French ships emerged on the horizon. Over 70 polygonal strongholds would be built or upgraded as part of a commission in 1859 instigated by Prime Minister Lord Palmerston, who shared the anxieties of most of Britain's naval and military commanders, that Britain was rapidly falling behind foreign powers and would be unable to defend itself from an attempted invasion. The fortresses, known as Palmerston Forts, stretched across the United Kingdom mainly in strategically important coastal areas. Each would cost the Treasury an enormous amount of money, require a significant labour force to construct, and a large group of military volunteers to man. In this video, I'll be stationed at Fort Nelson, one of the five gigantic fortifications built on the summit of Portsdown Hill, overlooking Portsmouth Dockyard. I'll find out what it took to design and build a fort like this, and our job is to build these absolutely gigantic ditches. If you're French invaders and you're getting these things firing at you, it's going to be pretty nasty, isn't it? How recruits were selected and deemed fit for service. They will be testing your physical appearance, even down to deformities of the, uh, the lower region, shall we say. And what life was truly like for those stationed on Victorian Britain's coastal front line. In 1815, Britain had emerged from the Congress of Vienna as the ultimate leading financial, military and colonial power of the world. Napoleon was in exile, never to return to the continent again, and the prospect of a prolonged period of peace seemed possible. Relations between France and Great Britain, whose mutual hostility towards each other had defined much of the last millennium, had softened immensely. The two had even been allies in the Crimean War. But there was a problem. The newly elected president and self-appointed Emperor Napoleon III was making British politicians and military leaders nervous. Would he invade where his uncle had failed? Napoleon III's expansionist foreign policy which saw his empire deepen its colonisation of Africa, and his desire to expand France's navy and improve its capabilities caused alarm bells, triggering an official royal commission on the defence of the United Kingdom in 1859. Instigated by the Prime Minister, Lord Palmerston, a huge programme of fortification to defend Britain's arsenals and naval bases was immediately put into action and thousands of navvies, essentially construction workers, were employed to either build or upgrade existing forts as quickly as possible. Helping me delve into the background behind the fort's construction was curator Richard Noyce. So here we are outside Fort Nelson. I'm dressed as the navvies, one of the uh, construction workers employed to build this magnificent fort. First question is about the location. I'm guessing it's got something to do with that big old dockyard down there, right? It has, yes. Portsmouth was the, really the primary dockyard. It's, maybe it still is. Uh, for the Royal Navy. So from the 12th century, it's always been defended. It's centrally located in the English Channel, which gives it easy access out. All the support services can be there. Uh, so you have victualling, which is the food and supplies. You have ammunition. You have the main dockyard for the repairs. And of course, at the time, 
The Royal Navy has always been our first line of defence. It's key, along with the Channel, but it needs a base, it needs a home. And if we lose that home, we lose that defence, then the Navy has nowhere to protect itself. It's interesting at this point when this Royal Commission on the Defence of the United Kingdom comes out in, in 1859, I mean, just how likely is a French invasion at this point? I mean, we've just had the Crimean War and we, we were allies, but clearly they thought it's sufficient enough to, to want building this. We were allies, but Napoleon III had come in and he'd been elected initially as president and then made himself emperor in the late 1850s. And that was a bit of an issue because he was the nephew of Napoleon I. So in Britain, there's the big fear, is he then trying to avenge for Trafalgar and of course Waterloo? But also at the Crimea, what we noticed was that the French were far better than we were. <laughs> so right, the, yeah. the army was a lot better, it was better led, it was better equipped. The Navy was better. They had the first use of ironclads, so the, the French had built the Guare, which was the first ocean-going ironclad, in 1858. And that meant uh, at the Battle of Kinburn, at the end of the Crimea, was the first use of ironclads, but it's French ironclads. So they were towing batteries full of these iron-protected uh, gun platforms, basically. And wooden ships were useless. And we suddenly yeah. realised, hang on, we're way behind, and the French are more powerful, large army, we're a real threat here of uh, right. invasion. It's ironic, we're almost playing catch up at this point, and yet the structure of this fort almost harps back to, you'd see them in the sort of Napoleonic era, this polygonal structure. Tell me a bit more about the design of the fort itself. Well, the design, as you say, is poly polygonal, and we, we actually use some French techniques. So there's uh, capaniers going out into the ditch. It's a very angular site, but on its own, the fort is, is useless because you've got the rest that you could let just bypass it and go around. So it's built in a system of forts all the way around Portsmouth. There's a ring all the way around. And this was designed for the Royal Commission in 1859, where they looked into defences. No money had been put into fortifications. And if you think about older castles and medieval castles, they're very tall, yeah. very big, thick walls. But with the advent of artillery and gunfire, of course, if you hit a wall, it's quite easy to make a hole and make a breach. There are also ways of saps, which are trenches going up to the wall, so you could dig, and that, that defeated virtually every other structure or fortification. So the fort, as you can see, is actually dug down. It's sunk slightly. Yes. So it's been dug into a pit. We're looking at the weakest side. So we're looking at all brickwork, which is very vulnerable, as I was just saying, to, to artillery fire. So the main defensive side is the other side, to the north side. Because the real threat was that uh, the French could land further up the coast, bypass, come around and then attack Portsmouth from the north. The actual cost for all the forts was around £10 million. Pounds. Four million, that's for the whole country. Yeah. And four million of that was just for the forts at Portsmouth. So wow. you can see that's the percentage around Portsmouth because Portsmouth is so important. As critical and expensive as defending the dockyard at Portsmouth may have been, constructing one let alone multiple forts around the harbour, was going to be a monumental task. The job fell to the Navvies, a community of manual labourers with expertise and experience in the building of public infrastructure, whether that be canals, tunnels, railway lines, or in this case, military fortifications. The first operation for these labourers would be to dig enormous ditches in the earth, surrounding the building which would eventually stretch 19 acres on top of Portsdown Hill. A job Marcus Harrison, visitor service supervisor at Fort Nelson, would assure me was no mean feat. And so after this uh, commission in 1859, mm -hmm. two years later in 1861, we're all brought here and our job is to build these absolutely gigantic ditches Absolutely. I mean, tell me a bit about what the process was like doing that. Okay, so the Navi was famous for um, many things. Uh, their equipment was the shovel and the pick. The particular purpose of this uh, ditch is to avoid uh, direct access from the enemy from what we call the counter scarp, which is the wall or the face opposite uh, the fort proper. So to dig on this scale, you're talking 60 feet across and 40 feet deep, if I can use Imperial. Wow. The length on this face, on the western wall here, is 600 feet, uh, just shy of 200 meters. Uh, it's huge, absolutely huge. And 
you would have required a workforce of uh, several hundred uh, labourers or navvies as they were known. Uh, the name coming from navigation. Uh, right, so the okay. canals of the 18th century were known as navigations and although we use it more as a slur as a pejorative nowadays, yeah. <laughs> uh, they were skilled labourers. Uh, they were taken from the uh, local farmhands generally. Uh, they were paid up to three times more than a farmhand, uh, which is remarkable and you can see the attraction. But uh, they, were a, they were a bawdy bunch um, and they had a very rough reputation. Right, so okay. much so that uh, from the 18th century through to the mid 19th century, uh, they were a, a law unto themselves essentially. How long would this have taken them to, to build? It's difficult to say exactly. We, we know that it would have taken uh, several months, probably close or upwards to two years. Uh, accounts are reasonable, but we don't know exact uh, dates. But you're talking probably a couple of years. The fort took nine years in total to build, 61 mm -hmm. to 70. Um, that being partly because we had to, or the government was releasing money slowly, shall we say. Uh, it's been conjectured that these may have taken as, as little as three years or so, depending. Um, but uh, yeah, it took the nine years because the government was reluctant to fund them uh, completely from the outset. Without any machinery to aid them in their struggle, digging 40 feet deep into the ground across such an extensive area must have required an unrivaled level of cooperation and perseverance. And so I wanted to learn a bit more about this enigmatic community of navvies. And uh, what was life for these navvies? You sort of touched on it earlier, mm, that they, mm. they sort of go from job to job. I mean, you've got to be really tough to Incredibly undertake these, tough. These, these sorts of jobs. You do, you do. Um, the, the age range is interesting. Uh, we're talking anywhere between 10 or sometimes even under because these were families that worked together. So sons invariably, brothers. So if people brothers, under 10 digging these, these ditches They here. would play a part. Yeah. Um, whether they were involved in the, the major labour is, is questionable, but yeah. they certainly would play a part in the overall scheme of uh, the construction. Um, it was really the farm hands, so from their mid-teens uh, onward, and it's not unknown for men in their 60s and even 70s to be excavating. It was a tough life. Um, diet was simple. Uh, they drank famously uh, huge quantities um, uh, as they were well paid and they were also, broadly speaking, again, uneducated. Yeah. So their, their, their strength, their authority, if you like, lay in their muscles, their ability to excavate. Um, and in the best cases, they were actually um, so professional in their, in, in their chosen tasks that they could employ people themselves. So it wasn't unheard of at the upper like scales. Essentially they yeah. were, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they shifted what was known as muck. So generally anything and everything was referred to as muck. Uh, they used their shovels to do so. Uh, Travelling between jobs, it was known as tramping, uh, interestingly. Now we would call it hiking maybe, or possibly even backpacking nowadays, but it was a term that was used throughout the 19th century, uh, so tramping from one site to another. Um, it, was, it was a tough life. A tough life it may have been, but the work carried out by the navvies was essential to the defence of Britain's most important naval base, not least because of its ingenious design. Digging into the ground and using the existing topography of the hill to construct the fort not only created an obstacle for potential French invaders, but an almost impregnable wall of chalk that was virtually indestructible. Were the French able to reach the wall face, any explosive charges would do little damage, and that would be the least of the attacker's problems. So Marcus, uh, apart from the ditches themselves, what other sort of defensive structures are there that would prevent French invaders actually taking the fort? Okay, as you rightly say, the ditch is substantial enough to certainly slow advance, but if they'd got this close, something arguably has gone wrong, yeah. and they have their sights set on taking the fort and then ultimately using the hill as we wish them not to. So if you look just behind us here, uh, you have something called a caponier. Now the caponier is a structure that was built specifically to defend the ditch and the fort plays uh, two parts. It keeps the enemy at bay at distance mm -hmm. using the larger calibre guns along the ramparts uh, but then it has to look after itself. So should the enemy lower themselves into the ditch uh, or somehow uh, attack en masse yeah. in person, this is what defends against them. Right. So in the lower levels here you'll have 32 pounders 
Uh, they use canister shot, which essentially turns the guns into shotguns. Uh, two on the lower levels. Originally, there would have been four guns intended, 24 pounders. That was later changed as intended to 32 pounders, of which there were only ever four right, on the lower okay. levels. Uh, behind us here, we have gun loops or gun positions yeah, I was for, gonna say, rifles. Yeah, for some rifles. Yeah, yeah, that's right, that's right. So these essentially protect the detachments. You didn't want anybody sneaking up and laying some charge against uh, the gun positions uh, or the larger caliber guns here. So that ensured uh, flanking fire. These happen to be the flanks. And I notice it's not around the entire fort, it's just at the, Absolutely. I guess, in key strategic points. Absolutely right. I mean, these guns here would have been able to rake the entire length of the ditch here. And course, just yeah. around the far corner, you have an equivalent, what they call a demi caponnier or a half caponnier. Right. Uh, if you look just behind uh, over here, we have yeah, something called a sally port there. or a postern gate. Now, that gate served an interesting purpose. Should the uh, French have, or a number of them, survived uh, any assault, this would have been used to access uh, those individuals. A ladder right. would have been lowered down. Okay. They would have retrieved the individuals and then interrogated accordingly. So this is why they happen to put the door as high as they do. So just to clarify, so this is if the French have come over yep. and there's potentially like a wounded soldier, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they could then take them in up the ladder Absolutely and right. interrogate them. And interrogate them. It was a bad day. <laughs> and it's just testament to, to the d design, right? You know, mm. they could have made it all the way over the ditch, mm, mm. but if they do, there's just another level oh, of, yeah, of clever yeah. defense. Like you said, it can it can shoot all the way along yes, as well. Yes, it's yes. just so cleverly designed, it is. isn't it? It's a 19th century castle to all intents and purposes. It works on the same principle yeah. uh, concentric castles did uh, in the medieval period. Well, I can't even imagine the strenuous nature of, of the work for the navvies, but of course mm. they wouldn't be the ones who were occupying the fort. No. They were just employed to build it. So Absolutely right. the people actually within the fort, they would have been the volunteers. Yes, they would. Yes, they would indeed. Once the fort was completed in 1871, a garrison of around 200 volunteers from the newly established citizen armies of part-time rifle, artillery and engineer corps, accompanied by regular army officers, would have staffed the fort in time of war. But not any old recruits would be stationed here. Volunteers would be scrutinised to be deemed fit enough to serve. Any mental or physical defects would be recognised and prevent men from joining the garrison. Not feeling in the best shape after even the thought of digging all those ditches, I was somewhat anxious about my upcoming inspection with Corporal Tom Davis. Wish me luck. Ah, Corporal Davis. Ah, you must be the new volunteer. I am reporting for duty. Very good, good to see you lad. Well, you mentioned uh, volunteers. It's important to make that distinction. Fort Nelson is not full of regular British Army uh, soldiers. We're volunteers. Well, that's partly true, actually. There would have been a garrison up here, generally, just to keep the, the things ticking over. But yes, the volunteer force was a major thing in the late Victorian era. So you are part of the Second Hans Volunteer Artillery Corps, which was okay. formed in 1860 and would exist until 1908, when it was incorporated into the Territorial Army, when all those reforms came in. Right, so tell me a bit about, you know, where these volunteers were coming from, and more importantly, why they were volunteering to be stationed at Fort Nelson? It's an excellent question, actually. Now, all of the people in the second Hans were actually from the local area. In 1880 alone, they could be found, all of them, within a few miles of their headquarters down on Governor's Green. And they're all from different backgrounds, so mostly upper middle and middle class people, but also there's a lot of working class people in there as well. So in terms of why they would be volunteering, lots of different reasons. It might be that they feel perhaps a patriotic duty to enlist. It was, after all, the threat of Napoleon III of France that did spark the volunteer movement in the first place. And during the South African War as well, there was a similar upsurge in recruitment as well, depending on whatever crisis was happening. It might be, of course, that you wanted to avoid getting sent overseas in the draft, because if you're yes, a volunteer stationed here, you get out of that. But also, and this is, I think, the most interesting part of it, it's to do with your social standing, because all of these people, all of them from the officers right the way down to the lower ranks, 
are of the same sort of background. So if you're a member of the volunteer corps, then that would elevate your social status just that little bit, give you a bit of edge in social standing over right, anyone okay. else. So it's all part of this sort of jingoistic period, isn't it? You can, mm. you can serve your country, but you don't have to go across to the uh, various corners of the empire. Absolutely right. Right, okay, and, and let's talk about a bit about the volunteers themselves. You know, this is the Victorian period. Not all of them are gonna be in absolute peak condition. You know, what kind of things are you looking out for that might stop them from being able to volunteer? Well, we're looking for all sorts of things, really. Um, it's important to note, actually, that when you look at the illustrations and the photographs of the volunteers, they're all actually in pretty good physical condition, to be honest with you. They're not, you know, strapping bodybuilders or anything no. like that, but they are all looking healthy. Uh, some of them would have been dock workers, that's for sure, maybe office clerks, and very few of them would have had any military experience. If you've got military experience, we'll have you in a snap. And of course, being an artillery unit, we are looking for a bit of strength. You're gonna be doing a lot of heavy lifting, so we need your muscles to be in tip-top form. Right. But there's really two things that we're looking for. And the first is money, believe it or not, because you don't just get to rock up, uh, rock up and be part of the volunteers for nothing. You've got to pay for your own uniform, first and foremost, and you buy that at cost, for at least for the fabric, and then you'd have it tailored to fit. And that would cost you, in 1863, about 10 shillings and five pence. Now that doesn't sound too bad, actually, but you remember, for, for a rural worker, you could be earning as little as nine shillings a week. Yeah, it's so gonna it, set you back a little bit, isn't it? It yeah. is indeed. If you're earning about 18 shillings a week, you're probably gonna be fine, because bear in mind, you've also gotta buy your equipment, you've got to pay a joining fee, and your annual subscription as well. Wow. So it's a big monetary investment for some members. The upper middle classes would certainly be fine. Apart from the necessary expenses, selectors were also looking for what was termed efficiency. Badges were allocated to so-called efficient volunteers who had displayed competent knowledge of drill and gunnery duties, having completed 30 drills in 18 months and attending the annual inspection of the Corps. But basic fitness tests were also conducted, as Corporal Davis was about to demonstrate. the fitness tests in the late Victorian era were incredibly strict. They would be testing you your physical capabilities, your movement, uh, heart disease, how many teeth you've got, even down to deformities of the lower regions. They would be, yeah, they would be, they would be testing you on that. But I'm sure you're fine. I'm fine. Yeah. But, of course, we're going to be doing the volunteer test. Now, I warn you, in the regular army, in 1860 alone, 47% of recruits were drummed out on medical grounds. Oh, so, are you, uh, so are you ready for, to do the volunteer medical test? I'm ready. Excellent. Attention! Very good. You look about the same type as me. You must be about six foot, I would wager. That's correct. Excellent. You passed the height. That's a good start. You'd have to be about five foot six in order to pass this. Arms up! what your chest height is. This is another important qualification. Oh, excellent. Look at that. 43 inches. Wonderful, wonderful. Very good. This is my crowd. The minimum for that is about 32. Oh, right. So, yeah. I so you, that one. you are absolutely fine, Danny. <laughs> and now, your final test. Welcome to the volunteers. That Thank is you all much. you need to do. Oh, right. You've got the money for your uniforms and you've got, and you're the right age, of course, 17 or above, then you're absolutely fit and fine. That's all we need. So you just need to be above a certain height, have enough money to pay for your uniform. Absolutely and then you're right, <laughs> yes, you'd be fantastic. But I am gonna give you something a little extra to try because this is going to be a physically demanding job. So oh, in gosh. order to test your physical skills, I've got a little something to show you. Here we are. Oh gosh. So this is the ammunition of a 64 pounder artillery piece. So this is a pretty, pretty big bit of ammunition. So this, you see the studs on the side here? I can. This is all to go inside the rifling, to connect into the rifling. So as it is loaded and as it's fired, these things connect to the groove, it spins the shot, makes it more accurate. Right. Now so I'm gonna ask you to hold this for me. Okay. To see how strong you are. You ready? Brace okay. yourself. Right. I'm gonna pass it to you, ready? Okay. 
Got it? Yeah, I've got it. Oh, okay, wow, wow. Yes. That is deceptively heavy. Indeed, and in fact, you're doing Gosh. very well for holding that just on one. Should I take that back? Yes, there yes, you please. go. So you're actually doing very well for holding it in one person because this would actually require two people. I can see that, yeah, this yes. is, I can tell my arms are already shaking after yeah. that five seconds. Yeah, you'd put this on a cradle and you'd have two people on large straps lifting this together. So the fact that you can hold this on your own puts you in very good stead indeed. <laughs> Once I had passed my inspection, I would be sent to one of the multiple barrack rooms located at the south end of the fort, where I'd be sharing a bedroom with many others. Volunteers would be expected to clean their kit, polish their shoes, and regularly shave their face, apart from their top lip. As an official new volunteer, I felt I had earned my first meal of the day. In the kitchen, food was prepared for the volunteers who would have dined and socialised in their barracks, separate to the officers who dined in the mess, passing the time away whilst they weren't on duty. As I had expected, the menu was not quite as exotic as we have come to expect today. Volunteers would have started their day with what one might call a simple breakfast. Some tea and bread. Now, they'd have this every single day, albeit with the occasional serving of bacon, fish, probably tinned, and if they were really lucky, jam. For their main meal of the day, things got a little bit more interesting. For dinner, remember dinner in this period was served at lunch, the volunteers would have a form of meat. This could be served as a stew, could be steamed, roasted, even baked, and they'd have that with some potatoes and greens. They'd have a dessert with that too. Could be plum pudding, a raisin, or tapioca. Although, believe me, that sounds more exotic than it really is. And then for tea, their dinner, it was back to literal tea and bread again. Whilst this menu doesn't sound like it's exactly brimming with flavour, and believe me, I've tried a Victorian dish or two in my time, what was important is that these volunteers were getting sufficient calories and they needed it because should the worst come, they needed to not only be mentally ready, but also physically prepared to defend Britain's coastline from French invaders. Now I had a full belly, it was time to get to work. As a volunteer serving at Fort Nelson, it was essential that I understood the layout of the fort and particularly the weapons used to defend it. Installed at Fort Nelson were open emplacements on the ramparts for 64-pounder rifled muzzle-loading guns and 6.6-inch howitzers. On top of this, three Haxo casemates were built for 7-inch rifled breech-loader cannons. All of these weapons were outcomes of new rapid developments in artillery technology throughout the mid-19th century. So, Richard, what do we have here? Look at this, this is a beast. Yeah, well this is a 64 pounder, so it's a rifled muzzle loader. So this came in, it wasn't actually designed at the start of the fort. When the fort was first built in the 18, 1860 and the first and the commission in 1859, they were looking at 68 pounders, which was still smoothbore. Right. Okay. So if you think artillery hadn't really changed and the fort was designed to have 30 of these around the ramparts all the way around. But at the same time that that was happening, they were looking at uh, Armstrong was coming up with the new rifle guns and breech loaders. Yes, of course. And they were brought in for the Navy because we said the Navy always had priority. They were the first line of defence, so they would have the best and the newest weapons. So for the, for the ironclads, were they? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so HMS Warrior, for example, was originally planned to have all these big new rifled breech loaders yeah. that would fire long distances, be more powerful. But what they found that the new design with Armstrong, as you got bigger in calibre, in sizes and projectile, there was a problem with the breach and there were lots of accidents. So what they did is they went back to the 68 pounder, which had proved itself very well in the Crimean War. It was powerful, it was very cheap to produce. So when the fort, as I said, when the fort was first designed, the seven inch came to the fort right. 
and they use them for flank defence. And talk to me about the uh, ammunition that these new rifled uh, artillery pieces would be firing. It makes them a lot more accurate, doesn't it? it, it, it they have those those grooves that allow yes. better accuracy. Yeah. As, as new guns came in, they were lots of obsolete guns available. So what mm. they did is they took them and used them for land service. And Palliser, who was a colonel, decided in the 1863, came up with an inventive solution, which was to grind down the inside of the, the smoothbore barrel and insert a, uh, an iron tube. And that had grooves in it, yeah. which was the rifling. So where we're saying they're still muzzle loaded, so like a cannonball, you still load at the muzzle end, Front. push the charge in and then around. And then that engages with the rifling. And it'll be spin, spinning, spinning, out, spinning, which is yeah. more accurate than a round ball. Mm. In terms of the evolution of artillery, I mean, the British in the Crimean War, they still have pieces that kind of hark back to the Napoleonic Wars, don't they? I mean, these just look to me more modern. Yes. Yeah, the, the Armstrong was the modern gun. Mm. That was the one that was, that was the way forward, if you yeah. like, the future. And what he did is he made uh, is a built up method. So he used different tubes on top of each other uh, on, on a various system, which made it stronger so you could take more powerful charge and to propel further. Mm. But of course, with the problem with the breech, they took a bit of time to to develop that. Yeah. So in the interim, between 1865 and 1880, they went to the rifle muzzle loader. Right. So this uh, it almost represents like the transition period, this gun here. Yes. And, yes. and it's pointing, where, is, where are we pointing? Because some people look at these forts and they wonder why a lot of the, uh, the artillery pieces are not facing towards Portsmouth Dockyard. They're facing inland. They're facing inland to uh, prevent any threat from the north. So any troops that land further along the coast can come along and attack the fort from the north. The guns with the longest range would be on the, the ramparts, which is around the top of the fort, to yeah. so fire over, over at a longer distance, which the rifling will do, yeah. will give you a long distance. We've then got the mortars, so the 13 inch mortars in the battery cover the area in the interim, so they cover closer in and they will drop exploding shells from the top. So they're covering all bases here, aren't yeah. they? And, and, and I suppose that's it's a good point, isn't it? When you think the French are probably wouldn't be silly enough to land their troops right by Portsmouth Dockyard, they might might they might try and envelop uh, the the, the harbour, wouldn't they? So yes. I, I guess it does make yeah. sense for them to be facing it seemingly the wrong way. And of course, the the harbour and the anchorage are protected by other forts. So there's a ring of forts all uh, crossing over. The fire is crossing, and so each fort there's no gaps. There's no way you can come in. So Richard, it's a pretty uh, bleak day at the moment. Uh, I suppose that volunteers like myself, we'd have to come up onto these ramparts and we'd be in charge of manning these guns, right? Yes, you wouldn't actually be in charge. Okay. You'd usually have a, a gunnery Royal Artillery NCO who would be the knowledgeable professional. He's if an you officer, like. yes. right. Okay. Uh, an NCO, non-commissioned officer. Okay. So he would provide the expertise and the volunteers would have some knowledge, but they could be trained quickly and provide the manpower of the lifting and the hauling uh, of the ropes. If you're French invaders and you're getting these things firing at you, it's going to be pretty nasty, isn't it? <laughs> yes, yeah, absolutely. With artillery now more lethal than ever, the casualty figures and wounds on the battlefield were only getting worse. The Crimean War had taken the lives of roughly 500,000 men and, across the Atlantic, during the American Civil War, over 600,000 soldiers and civilians had suffered the same fate. Not helping matters was the state of military hospitals. As weapons technology was rapidly evolving, battlefield medicine and nursing was quickly falling behind. At the outbreak of the Crimean War, the British government suspected that the conflict would last at the very most several months. In reality, it would last over two years. And the fact of the matter was, the British Army was woefully unprepared for the scale of devastation that was coming its way. This was acutely apparent in the day-to-day -day makeshift hospitals that soon became inundated with patients. It wasn't just the sheer number that were arriving with horrific battlefield injuries. It was the number that were dying due to diseases such as typhoid, typhus, cholera and dysentery. In fact, over 10 times more soldiers were dying due to diseases than they were 
from their war wounds. Something had to change, and someone had to change it. On the 4th of November 1854, Florence Nightingale arrived in Turkey with a group of 38 volunteer nurses from England. What they saw shook them to the core. In 1854, Erin, uh, Florence Nightingale arrives with a group of volunteers. They arrive in Scutari near Scutari, Constantinople, yeah. there, nowadays Istanbul. What do they see? Well, if you can imagine, they've already travelled a long way. It's taken them 13 days to get there. Um, anybody that's had to get to this hospital, it's not a real hospital in the way you would understand it. It's a prop-up right. barracks, uh, a makeshift sort of thing here. And they've had to come all the way up a very steep, muddy hill to get there in the first place. Uh, when they arrive at Scutari Hospital, it's pretty desperate. They've had to kind of uh, prop everything up. They've got hundreds and hundreds of men, so there's a real problem with overcrowding there. Right, um, not enough beds. Not so. enough beds and the beds are actually on the floor so right. so just uh, like this just here. like this that's, yeah so it's already pretty a, grim doesn't it yeah already a problem um supplies they've had a real problem with supplies getting out there in the first place uh, and so they're having to kind of just make do there aren't enough blankets and everything else uh, in the first instance and that's another thing right i can see all the blood already i mean these this linen it wasn't getting washed was it there was no form of washing at all no, no. and uh, it, and they've run out of any uh, replenishments for that so they can't even replace what they have um, at this time there's not really uh, historically a real understanding of what hospitals are required for anyway right. so that idea that we have now in modern terms of nursing and and care in hospitals that's not what was going on at the time okay. um, so they've got that but there's also a problem as later on they find out actually that this hospital up on this hill is actually above a cesspit so oh it's not very nice me. at all um, she's looking into the sanitation she's found out there's a dead uh, horse carcass in the water Oh, and they're uh, drinking in, that, that in water. the supply for the water uh, and that has now it's now um, leaking in uh, so we've got a real problem with their water supply uh, and the toilets are overflowing. Uh, so there's actually a nice sort of layer of sewage as well for them. They're not just coming in with like horrific war wounds, limbs blown off. Uh, they're drinking dirty water. They are, yeah. And they've not had a good supply of fresh water to begin with uh, from the battle camp. So these guys, they've come in, there's a big problem with dysentery. Yeah. Uh, there's a real problem. They've not had the nutrition. So they're actually having a problem with their gums. Their gums are very loose. They've got mm. teeth falling out. There isn't a good uh, supply of healthy food. Uh, so we now find out really that disease is an issue. It's not yeah. just the injuries that they've got in the first place. So Erin, you've painted a pretty grim picture. Uh, what does Florence uh, Nightingale, what are the first steps that she starts to take to try and improve things for these soldiers? Well, um, it's a social element, really. The one thing that is really key about Florence that, um, is that she is very organised. So she likes everything in good order. And she's learnt that through her sort of training with the uh, nuns in Germany. Um, so she sets about giving uh, an order to the, the women that she's taken with them. So mm -hmm. she's, she actually gives them a uniform. Um, so right, okay. these are quite often, they have a sash that would go across their bodies. Um, they might have an apron and a very dark uh, dress. So the apron can be changed over regularly. Right. So, um, these, so these are uh, proper nurses. What were the nurses like beforehand? <laughs> so uh, originally, as it stood, uh, people really in, hos in a hospital, as they understood it, if they couldn't cure you, uh, then you were considered terminally ill or you'd be sent to the workhouse. Uh, there wasn't really an understanding of nursing as a profession. No. Um, unfortunately, uh, it, it was much more sort of um, people known as drunkards, uh, not, you know, not so well-to-dos. No. Um, and they were basically, if they did their bit, they might get a payment in gin. So there was, a, <laughs> they, there was no real order of that in hospitals okay. at the time. So they weren't real nurses. They were kind of just like camp followers who were just looking for some extra alcohol. Potentially, yes. That's not really who you want to looking after you when you've got a, a limb no, that's no. being blown off. The or good something. thing about her though was that she um, she did put a very strict application set, uh, point in. Mm -hmm. So the, the the women that did come with them uh, with her, they did have some sort of uh, experience in some ways. And in fact, to the point that people did get turned away from our application process, including Mary Seacole. With greater attention focused on the practice of nursing as a profession, along with more stringent selection processes for applicants, Nightingale had already begun to make her mark. 
but to truly flip the odds of patient life expectancy, she would have to look beyond personal care at hospital conditions. Okay, so we move from a blanket on the floor, essentially, to a proper bed with fresh linen. Yes, so the transition from that is, in part of that organisation she was doing, she did also start to have an understanding of the fact that they would get in good order, they would start cleaning, she would organise supplies to come through, and has a good understanding that perhaps we have, like we have here, nice big open windows, ventilation. She went about ventilation. opening windows and yeah. all those sorts of things. Nice raised beds off the floor, raised an understanding beds, okay. of space around the bed, but yeah. also space for the patient okay. themselves. But aside from that, good sanitation. So, yeah. you know, the medicines, bandages, salt water washes, cleaning and washing, those yeah. sort of things. Some soap and soap, things like absolutely, that. Soap, absolutely, yeah. Right, okay. So I can imagine this involves, I mean, a huge overhaul of the, the entire system. Do we know how long this takes to get from lying on a floor with bloody sheets to a really nice bed with proper ventilation? Well, the truth is she, she, it started almost from the, the moment she's got back. So mm. of course she, she did unfortunately find herself to be unwell when she came back from uh, Scutari oh, no. and she pretty much would take to her bed at that point but continue to write through what she really did she was very good at statistics as well as being organized and so she started to kind of understand the idea of medical evidence um, and um, in about 1851 there were about 8,000 people sort of noted being used or in hospitals using hospitals as they stood um, and then some 20 years later there were about 20,000 which sounds right. bad because it's a big number but actually this is a good thing it means yeah. that the whole idea of how hospitals work and what they're used for uh, is entirely different and that's come from you know her legacy Absolutely. of that really. And those are people that needed care anyway and now they're in a, a specialised facility to get them better. I mean, it's almost like an enlightenment uh, of, of the 18th century, but with medicine, isn't it? Yes, very much so. So um, I think she's, the key point really is that she also was very good with in terms of medical evidence. Mm. So she was one for sort of looking back over things that had been done, um, one for improvements and how you would do, do, th do things differently next time, for example, um, but also recording. She was quite a statistician, so she would always have an idea of um, numbers. And uh, she actually uh, came up with um, this sort of diagram, which we've got uh, a copy of here. Oh, yes, yes, of um, course. And this is known as the Rose Diagram. Right, okay. So what, what's this about then? So the idea is that you can kind of get a good, good visual idea. It's obviously not quite a pie chart, but it's, it's along the lines of that uh, in terms of looking at the numbers and then mm. where the uh, problems really lie. So do they lie in sanitization or those sort of things? And it just gives you a very quick right. overview, uh, basically causes of mortality. So the reasons why people die. Uh, and from that, you start to realize that actually it's disease uh, and poor sanitation, uh, water for example right. being one of the issues, um, as opposed to just about injury and that was very much what was the cause of a problem in the Crimea. Well, she was certainly uh, extremely meticulous, wasn't she? That's one thing that I sort of, I concentrate a lot on. In fact, while she was a big, uh, she did orchestrate for nursing uh, and she trained nurses, she didn't do a great deal of nursing herself except no. for the bedside manner element of it and sneaking around at night to keep an eye on the soldiers but um, really it was the organisation uh, and her attention for detail. One group of men who might be less concerned with the state of military hospitals rather than the number of soldiers they had at their disposal was the officer class. The British Army in this period remained extremely regimented, and the garrison at Fort Nelson was no different. Officers stationed at the fort would have spent a lot of their time in their own private mess, separate from the navvies and the volunteers. Now, a volunteer like me is not supposed to be here, and you can see why. Compared to the ranks accommodation, the officers lived in a sort of relative luxury. With their expansive view of Portsmouth Harbour, this room was furnished with lovely mahogany table, cut glass, fine china, and comfortable dining chairs. What's more, the officers also had a separate room in which they could dine, and they had a bell to call upon the kitchen staff to bring them up a fine selection of cheese and wine. In the courtyard downstairs, you can also see the remains of the water pump. This was part of the Nightingale reforms and the overall improvement to hygiene and public health throughout this period. 
The forts here were the first buildings locally to have plumbed flushing toilets, as well as running water from taps. This was obviously mostly about keeping the army healthy and clean, but it would have also been a luxury that the officers could enjoy too. The officers would have likely had their own toilet block and separate space for bathing, meaning they wouldn't have to share with the other ranks. So there was this discrepancy in living standards between the officers and the volunteers, but one shouldn't make the assumption that this room was full of rich aristocrats who disdained their lower ranks living in utter squalor. Whilst it was usually the case that the officers were drawn from the upper classes, or at least the upper middle classes, at Fort Nelson, this wasn't the case. In fact, we have a list of commissioned officers' occupations, and they include a solicitor, a director of works at the dockyard, a manager of wine vaults, and a yeoman farmer. Having said this, if a volunteer like myself was caught loitering around this room without permission, they could expect punishment. Stay there! Discipline was strictly enforced. If you broke the rules at Fort Nelson, you could expect to be punished. Anything from drunkenness and ill discipline to theft and assault, and you could end up in one of these cells in Fort Nelson's guard room. In 1871, when the first regular garrison was stationed here at Fort Nelson, the volunteers were made subject to the regulations of the Forces Act. This made them subject to the Articles of War and the Mutinies Act, even whilst training. A few years later, in 1879, the Army Discipline and Regulations Bill applied army punishments to the volunteer force. Common military punishments in the late Victorian Army included a loss of rank, fines, a loss of privileges, extra duties and punishment drill, which involved exercise for up to four hours in heavy kit every single day. Short-term confinement, whether that was in the barrack blocks or imprisonment for up to 21 days was also practiced, and in extreme cases, volunteers could be court-martialed. From gun platforms and ditches to kitchens and prison cells, Fort Nelson truly felt like a self-contained haven. But there was one crucial and spectacular design feature within this Palmerston fort I had yet to see. Luckily, the severity of punishment for being caught in the officer's mess was not as bad as I had feared, and with my release, it was time for me to head underground. Now, as you've seen, the Palmerston forts were absolutely armed to the teeth with all the latest guns and artillery. And so they not only needed a place to store all of that gunpowder and ammunition, they also needed a way to quickly transport it to wherever in the fort it was needed. Over 19 acres of tunnels were dug by hand out of the chalk face. Heading south from its respective Caponia, the North Tunnel stretches 160 metres, whilst the East and West Tunnels are roughly 121 metres long. As the entrance is already underground, we know that the navvies would have had to dig down first to get there, and then even deeper to build the tunnel itself. And here we are inside the main North Tunnel. The first thing that strikes you is just how incredibly extensive and well built this thing is, considering it was all dug out by hand. The only bit of machinery that was used was a railway line that came to the bottom of the hill and then a cart that brought the supplies to the site. And so to say that this was hard work for the navvies is an extreme understatement. And it wasn't just hard work, it was also dangerous. We know of one navvy who was actually killed when he was run over by the cart. Ironically, the tunnels had a remarkably modern safety feature to prevent fires. To illuminate the magazines, another tunnel runs around the edge where lanterns could have been placed. These would have then shone through glass windows into the magazine itself, 
enabling the room to be lit, with no fire entering the magazine proper. But obviously this safety feature was only available once the tunnel was constructed. For the navvies, candlelight would have to suffice, placed in improvised recesses in the wall. To find out more about the massive undertaking, I reported back to my officer Tom. Tom, here we are. In the middle of the, this is the main north tunnel, isn't it? Absolutely right, yeah. It's impressive, isn't it? It's it, absolutely incredible. I mean, it's so extensive. Tell me, when, when were these tunnels built? So these tunnels were made during the time that the fort was built. And we don't know exactly what order they did everything, but the fort was constructed between, all 1861 to 1869, give or take. Right, so it's somewhere between that eight year period. And tell me, it would be the role of the navvies, am I correct? Who'd have to dig all of this out by hand. Yes, absolutely right. Yes, they'd be down here with candles and lanterns, and you can actually see all of the pick marks oh, in, yeah, the, you can. in the walls here from where they've hacked this out. Because what you're looking at is actually the inside of Portsdown Hill itself. So you've got chalk being the main rock, we've also got these big seams of flint oh, yeah, running yeah. through it as well. That's absolutely incredible. What was the main use of these tunnels? So there's actually two purposes to these tunnels. So the first job, and perhaps the most important, is as a store for all the ammunition that would have been down here. So the main magazines are back up the tunnel that way, and you'd have two of them with all your powder and all your ammunition that you would have had. But the other role is slightly more practical. It's to provide an easy, safe route for the soldiers to go from the barracks where we were earlier, all the way down to the defensive positions of the fort down there, without getting shot. Absolutely, and I can imagine it, it provides good safety as well, should mm -hmm. there be some sort of artillery bombardment. Exactly right, and that is what they're expecting. So you've got the main caponier down at one end where there's more gun emplacements, and there's staircases further up at the back that lead up onto the walls as well, so they can get to wherever right. they need to be. And you, and you mentioned there, it's not just about a, a storage facility for all that incredible amount of gunpowder and ammunition you're gonna need for those huge breech-loading cannons. Uh, it's also a quick way to transport it to wherever it's needed in the fort because they could be attacking, the French could be attacking from the east side or the west side. Absolutely right. And the other thing is, it's also where you do a lot of the maintenance as well for them. If you've got a defective gunpowder barrel that you think might be dangerous, you can't work on that in the magazine or you'll risk blowing the whole fort up. So you've got these little side rooms built into the tunnel where you can take a defective barrel to one side work on it and hopefully then return it to the main magazine when it's fixed. Now, so, some people think that these might actually connect all of the Palmerston forts. That's a myth, right? That is a myth, unfortunately. A lot of people do think that, um, but the only thing that does connect only some of the forts together is the reservoir, which is based in this fort and connects up to the other forts to provide fresh water. I don't know where this myth of the tunnels connecting up came from, but it doesn't make a lot of sense when you think about it because once you've taken one fort not only then have you got access to all the others but if the myth is true you can go take a straight line all the way down to the dockyards with it and that just doesn't seem like a very good defensive strategy to me. No, not at all. The tunnels under Fort Nelson epitomise the urgency of Palmerston's commission to defend Britain's coastline. Between 1865 and 1880, over one million pounds was spent on the forts designed to protect Portsmouth Dockyard. Yet, by the time Fort Nelson was fully constructed in 1871, it had become obsolete. A year earlier, the Prussian army led by Helmut von Moltke had stepped across the French border and was heading towards Paris. With this invasion, the threat of French troops landing on the coasts of Britain had all but evaporated, and with it, the purpose of Palmerston's expensive concrete fortresses. Whether or not Britain was ever really likely to be invaded, the risk of leaving its most important naval base unprotected was clearly thought sufficient enough to use a significant amount of the Treasury's purse building these fortifications. Aptly named Palmerston's Follies, mainly because it became clear they'd never be used for their intended purpose, and partly because they seem 
to be facing the wrong way, they nevertheless remain relics of a tumultuous age in which ambitious leaders and monarchs were looking to flex their muscles by expanding their empires at whatever cost. To us today, the idea that Britain could ever actually be invaded almost seems preposterous. And in hindsight, it's easy to use these forts to poke fun at the former prime minister. But we need to remember that Napoleon's rampage across Europe was still fresh in the memory of Palmerston and Britain's most senior military commanders. Had it not been for the heroic victory at Trafalgar, Napoleon was likely to have attempted a full-scale invasion. And so I think it's unfair to use this fort and describe it as the otherwise incredibly popular Palmerston's Achilles heel. One thing I am sure of though is that building this fortification and manning it would not only have been incredibly strenuous but also quite frankly monotonous. One thing I will say is let's hope we never need a garrison stationed here ever again. Fort Nelson was eventually disarmed in 1907 and then used for accommodation. During the First World War, it was used by British troops awaiting embarkation to the Western Front. And in 1938, as the world was on the brink of another deadly conflict, it was converted to an anti-aircraft ammunition store with 10 large magazines built on the parade ground. A decade after World War II, the fort had been entirely abandoned. After years of vandalism and neglect, Fort Nelson was eventually sold in 1979 and became part of the Royal Armouries in 1995, open to the public and explored by over 100,000 visitors every year. Thanks for watching this video on the History Hit YouTube channel. You can subscribe right here to make sure you don't miss any of our great films that are coming out. Or if you are a true history fan, check out our special dedicated history channel, historyhit.tv. You're going to love it.